Welcome to episode 63 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we will continue with the tales of Troy with the story of the Rape of Helen. We know that when King Priam was still a tender boy, his sister Hishan was carried off by Heracles, who had killed Lamoedon, conquered Troy, and given her to his friend Telamon. Although Telamon had taken her for his lawful wife and made her queen over Salamis, neither Priam nor his house had ever become reconciled to this loss. Once when the abduction of Hishan again came up in council, and Priam expressed deep longing for his sister. His son Paris rose and declared that were he but given a fleet and sent to Greece, he would, with the help of the gods, wrest his father's sister from their enemies and return victorious, crowned with glory. He founded these high hopes on the favor of Aphrodite and told his father and his brothers what had happened while he was pasturing in, with his cattle on the slopes of Ida. Priam no longer doubted that Paris was under the special protection of the gods, and Dephobus, too, seemed confident that if his brother appeared in battle array, the Argives would have to return Hesion. Among Priam's many sons was a soothsayer by the name of Helenus. He, of a sudden, broke into a flood of prophetic words, saying that if his brother Paris brought a woman home with him out of Greece, the Argives would come to Troy, razz the city to the ground, and slay the king and all his sons. This prediction caused a rift in the council. Trollius, Priam's youngest son, who was full of vigor and lust for action, was impatient of his brother's forebodings, taunted him with a charge of cowardice, and exhorted the rest not to let his unfounded warnings keep him from battle. Some of the others, however, were doubtful. But Priam sided with Paris, for he was full of anxiety and longing for his sister. The king called an assembly of the people and told them how in days gone by that he had sent an embassy to Greece under the leadership of Antenor to ask satisfaction for the rape of Hishan and bring her back to her kinsmen. Antenor's demand had been refused scornfully, but now, so said Priam, if the people were willing, he would send his own son, Paris, with a formidable host to accomplish by force what courtesy had failed to achieve. Antenor supported his proposal by rising and giving a vivid account of the insolence he, a peaceful emissary, had suffered in Greece, and described the Argives as arrogant in peace and timid in battle. His words kindled the people to fury, and with noisy acclaim they called for war. But Priam, who was a wise king, did not wish this matter lightly concluded, and invited anyone who had doubts about this enterprise to rise and have his say. Thereupon Panthos, one of the elders of Troy, rose in the assembly and related what he in his youth had been told by his father, Orthrus, who in turn had learned it from an oracle. It was that if ever a prince of the line of Lamadon brought home a wife from Greece, the Trojans would be faced with utter destruction. And so, the elder concluded his speech, let us not be tempted by the hope of martial glory. Let us live in peace and quiet rather than stake everything on the fortunes of war and perhaps lose everything, including our liberty. But the people muttered discontently and begged Priam not to listen to the timid words of an old man, but to do what his heart had already resolved. Then Priam had ships built on Mount Ida, equipped them for the voyage, and set his son, Hector into Phrygia, and Paris and Dephobus into the neighboring country of Paeonia to enlist allied peoples for the cause of Troy. Trojans, able to bear arms, prepared for war, so that soon a vast host was assembled. The king put Paris in command of it, and as aides assigned to him his brother Dephobus, Polydamus, son of Panthos, and Prince Aeneas, 
Then the great fleet put out to sea and steered for Cytheria, the Greek island where they expected to make their first landing. On the way they met the ship of Menelaus, king of Sparta, who was bound for Pylos on a visit to wise Nestor. He was amazed at the long procession of stately ships, and the Trojans on their part marveled at the beautiful vessel, festively adorned, which apparently had aboard one of the foremost princes of Greece. Neither side knew the other, but each wondered where the other might be going, and thus the ships passed, skimming over the waves. The Trojan fleet landed safely on the island of Cythera. From there, Paris was to go to Sparta and treat with Castor and Polydeuces, twin sons of Zeus, for the return of his father's sister. In the event the Argive heroes refused to give up Hesion, he was to take the fleet to Salamis and carry off the princess by force. Before embarking on this voyage to Sparta, Paris wished to make offering in a temple sacred both to Aphrodite and Artemis. In the meantime, the inhabitants of the island had reported the arrival of this magnificent fleet to Sparta, where in the absence of Menelaus, her husband, Queen Helen was holding court alone. This daughter of Zeus and Leda, the sister of Castor and Polydeuces, was the most beautiful woman of her time. She had been abducted by Theseus when she was not much more than a little child, but her brothers had gone in quest of her and brought her home again. As she grew to maidenhood in the palace of her stepfather, Tyndareus, king of Sparta, her beauty attracted hosts of suitors, but the king was afraid that if he chose any one of them for a son-in-law, he would make enemies of all the others. The crafty Odysseus, king of Ithaca, gave the wise counsel to demand from every suitor an oath that with his weapons he would defend the chosen bridegroom against any one whose hostilities the king might incur through his daughter's marriage. Tyndareus followed his shrewd piece of advice, but all the suitors swear the oath and then chose Menelaus, king of the Argives, son of Atreus and brother of Agamemnon. He gave him his daughter to wife and made him ruler of his realm. Helen bore her husband a daughter, Hermione, who was a mere infant when Paris reached Greece. One lovely Helen, whose days were dull and joyless in the absence of her husband, heard that a foreign prince in gorgeous array had arrived at the island of Cythera. She was pricked with womanly curiosity to see this stranger and his merit martial retinue. To satisfy this desire, she arranged a solemn offering in the temple of Artemis on Cythera and entered the sanctuary at the very moment Paris was completing the rites of his own sacrifice. When he saw the queen, the hands he had lifted in prayer sank to his sides, and his spirit filled with wonder, for it seemed to him that he again beheld Aphrodite, the goddess who had appeared to him when he was a shepherd on Mount Ida. Word of Helen's beauty had come to him long ago, and he had been eager to see her charms with his own eyes. But he had thought that the woman the goddess of love had promised him must be far fairer than the descriptions of Helen sounded to him. Besides, he had always had in mind a virgin, not the wife of another. But now that he beheld the queen of Sparta's face to face and saw her beauty rival that of Aphrodite, he suddenly knew with great clearness that this, and this only, could be the woman the goddess of love had promised him in reward for his judgment. The errand with which his father had entrusted him, the whole purpose of his journey, of his warlike array, vanished from his mind. He was convinced that he and those thousands of armed men had set out only to conquer Helen. When he stood silent, lost in the contemplation of her beauty, Helen too looked with undisguised pleasure at this handsome prince from Asia with his long curly locks and sumptuous robes of purple and gold. The image of her husband faded from her memory, and in its place rose up the radiance and youth in this stranger. 
but helen tore herself away and returned to the palace in sparta tried to blot that fair image from her heart and rouse herself to long for menelaus who was still in pylos but soon paris with a select few in his train appeared in the city of sparta and by stressing the importance of his mission gained entrance to the halls of the king even though menelaus himself was absent the queen received him with hospitality due to strangers and the distinction to which the sons of kings are entitled and with his skill on the lyre the grace and sweetness of his words and his ardent love overwhelmed the unguarded heart of helen when paris saw her falter and her faithfulness he forgot the cause of his father of his people and indeed remembered nothing but aphrodite's beguiling promise he assembled the armed followers who had come to sparta with him and tempted them with the prospect of rich plunder won their consent to help him in the plan he had conceived and then he stormed the palace seized the treasures of menelaus and carried off beautiful helen who to be sure resisted yet followed him to his fleet not altogether against her will when he was crossing the aegean the wind died down and the hurrying ships were becalmed on a quiet sea the waves parted at the prow of the ship which bore paris and helen and the old nereus lifted his head wreathed in water wreaths out of the salt foam and the drops oozed from his hair and his curling beard the ship stood as if nailed to the surface of the sea and the sea seemed like a wall of breeze built about the ribs of the vessel when nereus called out to them in terrible prophecy birds of ill omen fly before you accursed robber the Achaeans will come with their armies. They will snatch you from your sinful union and shatter the ancient kingdom of Priam. Alas, how many houses, how many horses I behold, how many men, how many dead bodies the descendants of Dardanus will owe to you. Already Pallas is donning her helmet, her shield, and the weapons of her anger much blood will flow the struggle will last for many years and only the wrath of a hero will delay the destruction of your city but when the important time is come the firebrands of the argives will devour the homes of troy so the old god foretold and he sank back into the ocean paris had listened in horror but when a fair wind blew again and the white hand of Helen lay in his, he soon forgot the warning words he had heard. The fleet cast anchor in the harbor of the island of Cranny, and now Helen, faithless and light of heart, consented to be his. In the joy of being together, each forgot home and country. For a long time, they lived royally on the treasure they had brought with them, and years passed before they set out on a voyage to Troy. And here ends my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.